of you don't want to be recorded, please do say. We want to record it because it's fantastic for people all around the world to hear the some things that Peter just said. Um, you know, we've got collaborators in uh, Uganda, uh, I'm sure, who would love to see that talk. Um, and that's a really good thing. Of course, in statistics, this doesn't normally happen to machine learning. People listen to and very policy. Um, very presentation that Nick doesn't want recorded because it's not yet a statistical conclusion. And if it were to be recorded, then people, it's just a, it's a discussion of a methodology that's in process. And if it were to be recorded, it's somehow like writing it down and yeah, someone exactly. might look at it and say, oh, now we must do this. And that's not the objective of what we're doing here. We're not talking about worldwide policy, but of course, if you record it, people can misinterpret. So if you are speaking and there's a bit you don't want recorded, please tell us. I think uh, what uh, Nick's going to do is either show the bit he doesn't want recorded at the end once we switch the recording off, or... So I'll, I'll play it in the middle and then we'll edit the video. If that's we'll play it in the middle and we'll edit the video out. So just, just let us know about things like that. So, okay, over to Nick. Uh, yeah, so I'm having a bit of trouble getting this. Okay, is it actually... Web. I've moved it into... Here, from down there. Um, yeah. But no joy. Blinking. Yeah, that's, so that's blinking. It's not to speak into this. That's all right. I can come back over here and clip the, okay, just clip the thing. It'll be fine, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I should clarify, uh, this talk isn't ex entirely about malaria. Um, Pete Gething was originally scheduled to, to talk in this, and he's, his focus is basically entirely on, on the malaria work here, and particularly on the Malaria Atlas project. Um, so I'm going to be talking for the first half about malaria, and about Pete's uh, work and others, um, and then I'm going to be talking about some more stuff that we're planning to do in the future and doing at the moment with Gaussian processes. Um, so first, a, a little bit on the structure of the group. So we're actually the Spatial Ecology and Epidemiology group, um, headed up by Simon Hay up there, um, and uh, Pete Gething's also a PI in the group. The major part of the work is the Malaria Atlas project, and historically that, that's been basically the only part. But we're basically <coughs> expanding out from there uh, and doing some work recently on dengue fever uh, and this new exciting mapping thing called the braid. Um, so this picture here isn't all of the group, in fact. We're up to about nearly 30 people now. That was just taken um, the size of the group. The last time it was actually sunny in Oxford, so we took the photo then. Um, so yeah, part, part one. Malaria. Um, the nice thing about having a, a group of sort of machine learning statistics people to get, actually get to use this slide and tell you a bit about malaria. Um, so it's really bad. Um, it causes about a million deaths a year and 450,000 cases. So uh, a million deaths is two Sheffields, and 450,000 cases uh, that's equivalent to seven times the population of the UK. So if all of the malaria is condensed in the UK, that's um, seven times you have to go to hospital each year. So that's quite a lot. Um, it's caused by five different parasites, um, of which the top two there, Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, are the clinically most important. Um, Plasmodium falciparum causes most of the deaths, uh, and is, um, most of those deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and then Plasmodium vivax is less likely to be fatal, um, but it's the kind that can keep recurring. It goes into the liver and hides from the immune system and then keeps popping up. And at the bottom of the list there, Plasmodium nolzii is really a monkey malaria, uh, which can get transmitted to humans, um, but not human to human. So mosquito bites monkey, bites human, human becomes infected. Um, and we're only just starting to realize that that's actually having quite a big impact in certain parts of the world. Um, so we've got some work looking at that as well. Uh, most of the work, in fact, all of the work I'm gonna be talking about um, on the malaria side is really about Plasmodium falciparum and the maps we've done there. But basically we're reproducing that work for Plasmodium vivax, which because of this liver stage and, and relapsing um, is really tricky. So we've given it to Marku, who's over at the back there to do all the difficult modeling stuff there. Um, but the cool thing is it's controllable and treatable, so you can control it with things like these mosquito nets, insecticided treated mosquito nets, and other vector control, and we have a drug which gets rid of it. So um, really there's a, just a big financial and logistical um, issue at the moment um, with, with trying to reduce the amount of malaria. So the Malaria Atlas project was founded in 2005 to sort of fill that gap um, and produce open access spatial information to help these people who are trying to control it and open source um, as much as possible. Um, so the, the main aim really is to produce global maps of the risk of malaria for that end. Um, also estimates of clinical burden. So we have sort of global estimates and, and national estimates uh, before this project based on the numbers of reported cases and uh, adjusting for um, sort of reporting biases and things. But um, basically we can drill down and produce a, a clinical burden esti estimate for any region you want to define on the globe with these maps. Uh, additional work uh, includes 
put a point on here, yeah. So so yeah, that's a malaria map up there, and I'll get onto that later. Um, other work includes blood disorder maps. So um, that's uh, sickle cell uh, anemia, or the allele, um, which um, is a good indicator for it, basically. Uh, and that interacts with malaria, so it um, allows some sort of protective effect against malaria. And also some maps of the distributions of mosquitoes that, that spread malaria. So the reason we want maps is that malaria is really spatially heterogeneous. Um, you can't just say it's, it's just in sub-Saharan Africa and, and then go and treat everywhere because some places quite close by will have varying, uh, vastly different amounts of, of malaria infection. Um, so we can identify these populations at risk. We can evaluate how good different interventions are if we actually know how much malaria there was before and then after the intervention on a broad scale, which isn't always uh, easy to do um, without these maps. And so we can evaluate options. So really these maps... Um, are, as well as just for the high level policy makers, they go to other modelers um, so they have something to work on because often you've got a set of data but you don't actually know the, the sort of malaria impact. And we need new maps um, because although people have been mapping malaria for a long time, um, they've mostly been done the sort of expert opinion way. You go and get people who know about malaria, you get them to draw on a map um, where they think uh, that the malaria is or where they think it's um, causing the highest burden. So uh, we've had a whole range of these sorts of maps of, of varying different levels of, of quality, um, but yeah, mostly they don't give that really detailed information, um, which is what that says there. So the approach that was taken to mapping malaria, specifically the endemicity of malaria, how much there is, um, how many, um, what proportion of the population is infected and, and uh, has to go to hospital with disease, um, there were two, two phases, really. One was to define transmission limits to rule out parts of the world where we know that there isn't malaria and can't really be malaria at the moment. Um, so we use regional endemic status, so that's if we, basically, there had never been a case report from uh, Russia in the, in the recent history, um, then we can basically rule that out. And we can also use biological masks. We know that certain areas, um, it's too cool for the um, malaria parasite to reproducing the mosquito sufficiently before the mosquito dies to maintain transmission. Um, and then after that, we get onto the fun Gaussian process based in geostatistics stuff, um, which is using a really impressive set of parasite rate surveys that, that were um, aggregated and combined in a formal statistical model. So this is a map of transmission limits. Um, Grey area, there's uh, no malaria, we're pretty sure. Red area, we're pretty sure there's uh, stable malaria. That's um, more than 0.1%, so um, more than one of a thousand people has malaria. And then there are these areas, and we've got a nasty little boundary up here where we sort of have to rely on the fact that these nations are reporting malaria, but we also think that it's pretty unlikely that there's a lot of malaria in these cases because of these sort of biological masks. Um, and that's obviously at varying different levels of, of spatial quality. So uh, Brazil, we've got lots of detailed information, not so much in, in the northern part of Africa. And the prevalence survey data, which goes into the um, sort of Bayesian geostatistical model, um, is really quite impressive. For somebody who's done work on um, mapping diseases, I'm quite envious of the malaria guys for what they've got. So uh, in the first uh, iteration of this, the first map that came out for Plasmodium falciparum malaria, there were about 9,000 parasite rate surveys. So a parasite rate survey is you go and you take a group of people and you take their blood and you test it for malaria and then you have the number positive and the number negative. Um, so 9,000 and then the second iteration of the malaria map, there are uh, 22,212 surveys. Currently in the database there are up to about 30,000. That's about 4 million people who, who basically we've got data from that have gone into this, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, uh, basically red, lots of malaria. Um, this sort of whitish colour, less, and blue, pretty much free of malaria. So there you go, there's some, some maths. Um, this is the basic formulation of the model. So we've got um, the number of people who are infected, given the number in the sample. So it motivates a binomial model. Um, and this P here is interpreted as the prevalence, so proportion of the population infected, uh, which is also the probability in the binomial model, um, which is modeled with an inverse logit function. Then we've got the function of x, uh, location in space, and t, location in time, um, which is a Gaussian process. Um, and then we've got an extra error term on there, um, which is equivalent to an additive kernel um, with white noise, essentially, um, which is to account for the very small scale heterogeneities you get. So you can get sort of local 
village level differences which are basically below the resolution at which we're predicting this. So we're predicting this to, to pixels. Um, so we just model that as, as white noise. So there are some tweaks to that. that that's not quite enough. Um, firstly, prevalence is age dependent. Um, so if you go and sample a population, there's going to be much more error in, in the young people than there are in the older people. And that's because of immunity, mostly. Um, people if they get infected enough times with malaria, will, de level, will develop a certain amount of immunity to the disease that prevents them getting reinfected. So we get this sort of hump distribution here. So there was a, a nice paper by some um, colleagues, so Dave Smith uh, and guys in the US, who um, basically um, tested a whole load of different models. Uh, and we sort of repeated that analysis with a, with a Bayesian um, uh, regression model uh, about that. And, and that's used to correct the data as it goes in. So we know the age of the people in each of these prevalence surveys. And we can standardize it all to say that we're predicting malaria in two to 10 year olds, even if that's not what we got the data for. Um, and then we can run it back through the model afterwards and get whatever age category people want. Nick, quick question. Were these, um, is it that the elderly people are just asymptomatic, or are they actually not carrying the parasite? If, if they've grown up in, in that place and they've had Twenty malaria infections. They actually, the body will have a decent immunity to infection, so they don't have the parasite. So uh, there's another tweak is that there's the seasonality parameter in, in the covariance function. And um, before anybody gets worried, this isn't the true <laughs> covariance. That's a woodly line drawn in paint or something. Um, so it doesn't actually do that there. But the the, the main point is it, it decays with time with temporal lag. Um, but there's a seasonality sinusoid, which basically says that um, this time of year is quite correlated with that time of year, not so much with the sort of intermediate thing, because malaria is quite seasonal in many parts of Africa and the rest of the world as well. Um, so this is uh, the covariance function that was used in the end. Uh, so the covariance of uh, space and time. This is a covariance function from Stein. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with this myself. I think it's a, related to a matern. It's a matern-like thing. Um, this here is uh, the, the function around time which produces this, this sort of sinusoidal decaying relationship. Um, so just sort of shove it in there and it comes out and so there are some hyperparameters in that um, difference in time. And this is a location in space. So to, because we're doing on quite a broad scale, we have to account for the curvature of the Earth when calculating distance. Um, and this bit here um, is anisotropy. So uh, basically we don't necessarily want to assume that, that the sort of correlation in malaria in space is equal in all directions because this model's capturing lots of stuff. It's capturing environmental drivers as well, um, and a lot of those aren't necessarily um, blobby. Um, if you have them on a map, a lot of them are sort of stratified in different directions. So that's uh, designed to capture that. Um, and a note about the implementation here. This was uh, fitted in a, a Python library for, for Gaussian processes um, called PyMC. Uh, and the main reason for that is that the first postdoc to work on this is a guy called Anand Patil, who um, co-developed this um, Python library. It's one of these general purpose libraries for MCMC, so similar to, to WinBugs um, and uh, Stan and things, which are available now. Uh, he uses adaptive Metropolis Hastings. Um, and he also wrote uh, a Gaussian process model um, to go to go on it there. Um, so yeah, you can run an iPython notebook and everything. Um, so I, I'm not sure the module is actively supported now because like all guys who are um, sort of technically literate and come from California, he's now gone off to a very successful startup um, which is making lots of money. Um, so I mean, the disadvantage of this is that, yeah, it's MCMC. So unlike GPI, it's gonna take a long time to run a lot of these models. Um, and in fact, it took a very long time and cost a lot of computing resources to fit these models previously. So um, current work is, is more focused on some of the approximations um, that these guys have been talking about. Um, so yeah, basically with this approach, we can produce a map of endemicity. Uh, so this is the standardized two to, two to ten year old. As I say, you can convert that into a bunch of different things, including things like R0 maps, which is uh, the rate of reproduction of the parasite, um, which is just a useful epidemiological tool for some people. Um, but as well as just having a map of the incidence, we've got full posterior distribution every pixel. So this is a parasite rate along the bottom. That's a probability distribution there. So obviously very low risk around this area here. Most of it's below this stable limit that was defined. High risk here, but obviously there's a lot of variability. Um, and some of that is, is gonna come from uncertainty. Some of it's gonna come from inherent variability. I mean, 
there is this stochasticity at the sort of pixel level, um, which isn't going to be entirely accounted for this, by this sort of broad scale map. So yeah, uh, red areas, high prevalence obviously, so lots in West Africa and so on. Cool, so new work, uh, and this is uh, the video which unfortunately isn't going to be on the, uh, the video of this talk, so I'm just going to... Cool. Right, so welcome back to the video if you're watching online. <laughs> so malaria is great, uh, but there are a whole bunch of other diseases as well, and we don't want to just focus on malaria, that would be unfair. Um, so in fact, um, Simon uh, and others in the group um, wrote this nice paper looking at the current state of global mapping for, um, for infectious diseases. Um, and the upshot of it was basically um, a figure similar to this. Um, so if we've got all of the diseases in the world for which there's some data and it's worth mapping them, i.e. you don't want to map something like Epstein-Barr which is basically in almost 100% of the population and there's no spatial signal there. And we take those and we take the amount of data that is available um, and then we say how good a job have we done conditional on the amount of data that's available. Um, so for something like malaria you'd expect to have quite a good map because we've got lots of data. For something like, sorry these are upside down unfortunately, the glanders, um, you probably there's not a huge amount of uh, spatial data available to fit these models. But it's how much we've done on each one of these. Um, so this is basically the proportion of the work that needs to be done that has been done. Um, and these are area proportional, if in case anybody wonders about that sort of thing. So there's a lot of work to do, basically. A lot of space to fill in um, on the global infectious disease front. Not all of these diseases are going to be as clinically important as others, um, but <laughs> we can um, sort of go through those and work out which to do first then. Um, just in case anybody's wondering, monkeypox is the best one here. And that's not because we have the best maps for it, that's because given the amount of data that's available, they're doing a pretty good job. So every time there's a new case of monkeypox, which only really appears in Central Africa, um, they know where it is and, and that's really well taken care of. So that's where this new project comes in. It's called ABRAID, um, which everyone keeps forgetting what the acronym is. It's Atlas, Atlas of Baseline Risk Assessment for Infectious Disease. But the basic idea, oh, this is working now. Huh? The basic idea is a big automated system that will suck in data from the web, um, triage it, push it through some automated modeling algorithms, and then push out risk maps. Um, yeah, which is hopefully everyone's slightly scared by this thought. Um, so firstly, the current state that's coming from the web, um, there's sort of a precedent for that. So the Health Map Project, which is um, based in Boston, does some fantastic work here. Uh, and they get sort of news reports and a bunch of different types of information. I think they suck in the PubMed stuff as well. So that's just publications, scientific publications. Um, and they extract geographic information and they have loads of, they do a lot of, sort of natural language processing to work that stuff out. So it's really cool. So there's just, there is a stream of data that's automatically coming in uh, and there's potential to add other bits and pieces as well. So GenBank's quite a, a nice idea. So if somebody posts a sequence on GenBank, which basically everyone has to now, um, this normally comes with uh, latitude and longitude, so that can help. And we like the idea of using Twitter. Everyone likes the idea of using Twitter. It sort of remains to be seen how effective that'll be, but it's something that's worth trying. So yeah, obviously this data is going to be pretty messy as it comes in. So there's going to be this, this triaging period to get rid of stuff that's noise rather than signal. Um, and the idea here is to have an expert panel who know about this disease uh, and they'll say, well, that's absolute nonsense. Uh, you're not going to get um, dengue in Alaska. Um, so they can look at that and, and basically rule out these sort of data points. That's an awful lot of work though. Um, so eventually we'd like that to train a relatively simple machine learning algorithm that will do some of the work and classify some of that data to say, yeah, it looks decent or no, this is pretty dodgy. And we can either exclude it or just weight it when using it in the models. So there's this, uh, it's a grey box, it's deliberately a grey box. Um, from the perspective of the, the infrastructure, it's a black box, it just goes in and comes out. Uh, but obviously we want to know what's happening with these diseases, we don't just want to leave it and then trust the, the outputs. But then it'll produce a risk map and that'll hopefully go back in to help the experts to define whether the new data points look reasonable and possibly even to let the, the machine learning algorithm bit do that as well. So yeah, um, big plans. Um, we're funded for 12 months in the first case by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and we've got in some professional programmers from a consultancy who started uh, a couple of weeks ago um, building this. So the whole thing is going to be open source uh, and it's all up on GitHub at the moment. If you go to the, our GitHub pages, um, you can have a look at it all. So yeah, hopefully anyone will be able to, to look at it and work out what's going on in there, including us. Um, so yeah, from the, from the modeling perspective, we're going to get data on loads of different diseases, they'll come into this component and then they'll produce loads of different risk maps. 
So we need something that's going to be fairly general, that's going to allow us to, to fit these models. Um, so yeah, these are the main challenges. Um, accuracy is very important. We also want to express our uncertainty because of a lot of holes in these data. Um, and yeah, we need this one size fits all model, which is not going to be easy. Um, so as an example of the sort of data that we're likely to get, um, this is some of the work that was done on uh, dengue modeling. Um, so this data is not like the prevalence data that we have for malaria. Uh, it doesn't say how many people are infected at this point. These are just reports of, of where the disease um, has occurred. Um, the, the, these blue dots are different only because that's dengue hemorrhagic fever cases, which is a, a particularly nasty set of symptoms, but it's caused by the same pathogen. Um, but these are all modeled together. Um, so yeah, we, we've got areas where we don't really know what's going on. The colouring in the background was an attempt to deal with this in the, the dengue modelling work by assessing countries based on whether they'd had reported cases or whether there was other information there were cases and then comparing that against the quality of, of their sort of reporting rate right, health in infrastructure. So um, if it's green it means there's, there's lots of good um, good information coming from that country. No cases, probably it's not there. Um, red means that there are lots of cases there and something in the middle, a sort of uncertain category, uh, like around here, means that we haven't got any cases but we're not entirely sure because we don't get a lot of stuff coming out of that country to, to be sure that it would be reported if it was there. So this is sparse data. It's also presence only, um, which causes issues when fitting um, st statistical probabilistic models. So the approach that was taken for, for dengue work um, and has been used fairly widely in, um, in mapping of diseases is uh, species distribution modeling, which is very popular in ecology. So basically, you have all these records of where a species is and you want to make a map, but what this essentially is, is it's an aspatial model. You do a classification, presence or absence of the species, and I'll get to the sort of presence only bit in a second, um, in environmental space. Um, and the advantage of that is that if you have these sort of uncertain regions, you can predict well there. So I mean, it's similar to just having the linear model in the example, in the um, sort of mean function, in the geostatistical models that Peter uh, was talking about. Um, but there are a whole bunch of different types of models you can use. Obviously, it's just a classification task than than linear. Um, so yeah, we need, we require some kind of other data to go there to go with the presence only data, uh, which we normally refer to as pseudo absence data, if you're doing a horrible hacky thing and just producing some fake data and then comparing that um, in a, like a binomial likelihood. Or you can use slightly more sophisticated methods, which are essentially very similar to the point process type model that, that Peter was talking about. Um, but um, with the added advantage that you can account for bias um, in reporting rates from that, i.e. You don't want to, to compare the presence to, to the background in environmental space in countries um, where you're not likely to get reports anyway. You, you don't want to use that signal to say tell the model that it's not there. I didn't do a very good job of explaining that, but, but never mind. So that's um, basically there's a very popular model in ecology called, called MaxEnt, which has a, a, a maximum entropy argument for fitting the model, which it's uh, about nine years later, everyone's just realized it's actually just a problem. So yeah, these are well studied and they are very, very widely used in ecology. Um, so there are issues with them. One is that they uh, make an assumption that the fundamental niche, so in ecology that means um, basically all the extrinsic environmental variables define an area where the species can be. Of course, there are other, there's other stuff referred to as a realized niche, so it could, could be competing with other stuck on this fundamental uh, niche thing. Uh, assumes equilibrium, so it's not very good for emerging diseases, um, which is a class that includes a lot of the diseases we have on the list, i.e. something like um, new strains of avian influenza, which are spreading from a, a place where it's emerged. Um, we need to know where it's going to stop or where it is now. Um, and yeah, they discard the spatial information. So if you, if you imagine we have environmental variables that are basically pixels, just like an image, points with them. That wouldn't change the, the actual model itself. Near this point or near a point in the middle at all. So it's uh, an example of um, what you can get from these. This is the, the 
some of these areas. And in fact, it says that, that these that we weren't sure about, actually, we've got a fairly good idea that uh, there's no dengue fever going to be there because it doesn't really match the uh, environmental stuff. So we can produce models withheld validation data and all of the dengue. So the uh, machine learning approach that was used to fit Um, sorry for mentioning another type of machine. Similar to a classification tree, you make binary splits um, based on the values of classifying as one zero on the basis of that. You partition it and you basically do a regression. X1 and X2, uh, and that gives something which you You basically fit one, take the residuals, fit another one, take the um, and basically if you combine loads of those, you can get quite complex model interaction in complex uh, in large environmental space that you can also get with Gaussian processes. One problem is that you get these horrible steppy functions that come out of it. From an ecological, epidemiological perspective, um, I think this is silly. I mean, maybe you've got a threshold down here, but that, that doesn't and, and bootstrap them and build another big on smooth thing, and you can get some confidence intervals out of them. Um, um, so, uh, sort of the tail end of my PhD Um, as in this sort of in this domain, um, but basically, boost regression trees are used because, in a big comparison of all the methods that people were using, they did very well. And the, it seems like the reason for that is that they can capture this complex um, behaviour. And that's uh, basically illustrated at the bottom here. So this is an entirely artificial function. Probability that species is present on the y-axis, uh, temperature and rainfall, but they're, they're made up anyway. It's a Gaussian mixture to make them. But there's a sort of banana-shaped function there. If you fit any additive type model, it can't capture that banana behaviour in, in uh, environmental space. The boosted regression tree model can, but it's, again, got this nasty, steppy behaviour. And Gaussian process obviously does very well in this sort of uh, case. Um, so uh, comparing that with a couple of other species distribution modeling approaches, that, that's uh, GAMS, which uh, Peter mentioned earlier, uh, which are basically, in, in the most widely used case, an additive um, Gaussian process, but with these issues that they're not very nice theoretically, and they might give the, the wrong result. Um, so comparing them with these two on a, a set of 230 odd plant species distributions for the UK is one of the areas where we actually have really good data to test. Hold out deviance um, was much lower for the Gaussian. Um, the implementation that I wrote. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that decision. That's based on the fact that it's a Gaussian process is a Gaussian random field, and that term is more widely used in other areas. Starting to regret that now because we, well, a lot of the exciting stuff is coming from Gaussian processes, but we'll see. So yeah, uh, Gaussian process classification does really well, so uh, very promising uh, for these applications. Other advantages, I mean, you've had all sorts of different advantages for GPs, but in this prior knowledge that we already have about um, the ecology, epidemiology of the disease, uh, we can add that via the mean function. You could either, you could also add it via the covariance function, and that's something that I did um, in this model, it actually has basically says what's a reasonable um, length scale to have, so it can't basically fit this sort of regular law. It could if there was enough. Prefer smooth terms. Um, we can marginalize uncertainty from polygon occurrences, which is quite nice. So if you use a particular version of the squared exponential covariance function, and you've but that covers a whole load of different environmental variables of those environment, that particular environmental variable in that polygon. You can also have by 
of making a, an assumption of Gaussianity. Um, so that's quite handy. I mean, that, that's something that comes up quite a lot, is that we don't know the specific point, but we know that it was in an area. And compared with all this really heavy... Um, we can. Um, so um, movement models. Um, so basically if you've got something like spread around, it, it's not going to be stationary, so we want some kind of differences. But it's not going to be just from city to city because it's moved by infected people. This green means there's lots of people living there and the deterministic models that will infer the models you can parameterize some, you can use non-parameterized ones, but they So yeah, you can predict movement there. And you basically will get a distance matrix between every single pixel in this grid in the same way that you would if you're doing a spatial model. You calculate the distance between everywhere. Um, but of course, that's not just a geographic connectedness of those. Um, but because you've got a distance matrix, function, I get a positive semi-definite matrix with a bit of manipulation in many cases. Um, I mean, you've got these sort of spatial models that Peter was talking about. Predictions. Probability um, of disease here, blue low probability of disease here, here. This is the same effect that Peter was showing with the linear mean function, but in this case we're using a Gaussian process um, to, to fit that. And then you've also got movement. So between these these different cities, and the interpretation is that if you if you have disease in this city over here and it's really highly linked to that city over there, but you don't have any information, probably are going to have it there, and vice versa. It's over here, you probably don't have a disease. You don't say it's moved from here to here to here. But Hopefully, captured diseases with different um, and then sort of disperses like that might be better modeled by a spatial model. Something's very environmental, um, soil, um, or something like bird food. So we can encode these all towards different types of data, um, and we can do the convolved GP type stuff that, that we've has in the, in the winter school. So basically if we have multiple different diseases and we know that the presence of one disease tells us something about the presence of the other, either because they um, share similar environmental, um, uh, environmental drivers or because they actually interact with one another. For example, there's um, an idea that lymphatic filariasis, which is another type of, of worm similar to the lower lower that Peter talked about, um, has a negative correlation with malaria. Um, that may or may not be the case in various different places. There's not a lot of data on it. But we can encode that sort of information, model multiple diseases, and use share information between them, basically. Use That's about it. I think I might have overrun. I'm not entirely sure, actually. Oops. Oh, no. All right. Um, but, yeah, so this is uh, the C group who basically... As I say, there are lots more of them, but um, look us up on, on the web. We've got a couple of different things, and a lot of the information um, and code and things that go into these models uh, is either there or linked from there, uh, and we're funded by a bunch of different uh, uh, people. So the Wellcome Trust have been very strong funders of the Mary Atlas project, and the MRC um, fund uh, different parts of the project as well, and the Gates Foundation are funding the, the current upgrade stuff. So. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Questions? There's a really nice meta question in this whole area when you're talking about the array. How do you, how can you end all these data coming in? How can you balance quantity against quality? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, I think, I mean, for me, a lot of that's got to be in the likelihood, right? So likelihoods is how weight, how important this information is. And, and, but we're really restricted in the number we use. We sort of, uh, now it's Poisson for point process, or um, yeah. it's a, a binomial or a Gaussian. But in actuality, of course, we probably need the negative binomial or uh, I think the better name, gamma Poisson for over dispersion. Uncertainty in, in um, weakly informative information needs to be treated carefully. And I think that problem's only going to get worse, isn't it? Because I like the example of, we all like the example of Twitter informing these spatial models. Yeah. And there are experts here who are using a language modeling to try and pull in language and, and relate it, correlate it to other things. Like people have done like rainfall maps based on Twitter if we're correlating these things. But then it's vital, isn't it, that some idiot's tweet doesn't cause a mass yeah, yeah. Uh, invasion of a health team into a village to deal with... Hmm. Uh, some fever. I think really that's important. that's why I say you need. To see, I mean, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It has to be in some form a likely best solution. But having a sufficiently rich class of models to capture the idiots who tweet, as well as a sensible people, <laughs> is a real challenge. Yeah, hmm. I mean that's something we're really interested in uh, trying to do. What well, I think a big challenge with that was sort of the, in the one thing we've been working in uh, Sheffield got a method that we hope might attack this is the diverse range of likelihoods you suddenly need. Yet you need to have chosen your approximation methods up front. And normally we accuse approximation methods in the context of knowing the likelihood that's going to be used. But if you're getting all this different data coming in, mm -hmm. um, you need an approximation method that works well for all these different types of likelihoods and I think that's a big incoming challenge um, and, and one of the challenges I think we're all trying to get together to try and solve. Yeah. I think th th these, these problems are manageable because you have that information and you can do something with it but when there are areas that aren't going to report or aren't going to report in the same way then mm. you're gonna be, you have to be, you'll be completely biased towards yeah. the uh, Well, I mean it does depend how you handle it a bit um, and if I go back to yeah with the convolved models I mean in, in a similar sort of way, if you're fitting one model for all the diseases any one time, you can share the information that um, the disease hasn't been reported from the locations where all the other diseases have. And that, so that incorporates some of this bias. I mean, you're then not fitting um, to any data points but from one of the countries. Are reporting because there's no disease or just because they don't have the technology to report or they don't report in the same way? Well, I mean, if they're reporting other diseases, that implies that they that have the healthcare infrastructure, that they can report disease. I mean, you have to be a bit careful with that as well. I mean, you might want to group by different types of disease that are reported in the same way. But basically, this is one, one of the ways of overcoming bias is that you just select the, the contrast case from the same bias if you can model it. And that's one of the advantages that might come from doing all these different things. Um, yeah, with respect to sort of filtering data by, by quality, obviously we're quite uh, we're relatively naive when it comes to the, the specific data sources that are coming in. Um, with the dengue stuff, there's a lot of manual filtering of data and going in and just taking the best and saying well it looks a bit dodgy and getting rid of that so it's going to be interesting to see to what extent we can pre-filter using a machine learning approach and train it with experts and yeah it, it's a very interesting area and not easy one of the other things is that uh, computational complexity is basically going to be online learning and, and uh, it's similar way to, to Peter's example with um, gastroenteritis, that you can have new data coming through quite regularly. It would be nice not to have to rerun all these models. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there are solutions to that in some classes of GPs and things. But well, I think and, uh, Richard talked a little bit about that uh, last night and yeah. how to, to assimilate data as it comes in, but importantly then ad adapt your covariance function parameters, because if you've got very little data and you're starting out and you don't have an idea of the covariance function, how do you evolve the Gaussian process over time to actually once it's becoming clear what the picture is, and, and uh, Rich gave some nice thoughts on that last night too. Yeah. Are these data sets available? Uh, which, oh, so the malaria oh, stuff, yeah. Maybe like the, the abrade stuff is probably... At the moment we don't have anything for abrade because they're only building the system. Oh. And so Health Map, who are going to give us most of the data, yeah, all their data is available from their website, which is Health Map, which is Google Health Map. Um, their, all the malaria data is downloadable from um, the Mar Malaria Atlas Project website. There's a data explorer. And more different data sets from that project are coming online as soon as they're sort of made ready and prepared so that they're easy for people to navigate and stuff. 
and uh, dissemination is a big issue and there's basically a whole project funded on how to share the information to the people who need it particularly posteriors from the big malaria model so we'll have all of those same issues with um, a braid but hopefully we'll be a bit more prepared So um, I'm afraid you missed your coffee break. No. <laughs> we're, over, we're overrunning, which uh, is totally purposeful because I think in a workshop you just don't want to stop the flow when people are getting into things and uh, you're hearing important stuff um, and you want to hear the questions. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. So we'll start five minutes uh, later than uh, scheduled with uh, Peter's talk after the break. Um, we can always run into lunch a little bit if uh, uh, 